Um, hello, everybody. My name is Sergey. I work as software engineer at Eclectic IQ. Um, lately, more like CTI engineer. And I will be talking about one interesting uh, method that you can use to squeeze out more information out of uh, mitre attack techniques uh, in your data. So, some hypotheses that I wanted to verify doing this work. Um, first one was that threat actors operating uh, um, have preferred modes of operation, and sometimes the techniques they use differ from different actors. Um, we maybe it might it might be possible to to detect those looking at the attack techniques used, and if you combine uh, actors per nation state, for example, for some group, some of those peculiarities might become more pronounced and more visible. So let's see if that uh, holds true. Um, we have a uh, in Eclipse IQ Infusion Center we have a, a database where uh, we have a ton of entities from multiple providers. Uh, it looks something like that, like a big graph of uh, connected entities. And the um, first problem that we need to solve is to uh, gather the data that it will be relevant for specific actors that we want to analyze, because we want to know techniques only for specific actors, not for uh, everybody in our database. So uh, looking at this graph, if we pick one threat actor, like which entities are relevant for this threat actor? Like we can walk the graph as long as we want, and we can probably walk to other threat actors that are completely irrelevant, because we have uh, MITRE uh, technique as TTPs here, we have some reports that have overviews of our activity over the quarter or something like that, uh, it's quite noisy. So the first thing we need to do is figure out how to walk the graph and gather some statistics. So algorithm would be if you have a data store with sticks data that's connected, and if you have CTI data model on top of that, so it's not just random connections between sticks entities, but you have some um, CTI semantic data model on top of it, and if you use MITRE attack uh, taxonomies on that, on those entities, we can proceed with the, with the walk in the graph. So we're going to start with the specific threat actors in the graph. Uh, we're going to walk the graph until uh, we decide that it's far enough or we hit a stop object, which is too generic, or um, it's a report that con contains a lot of neighbors, so we define a set of rules to walk the graph. Um, for every actor in question, we gather the context. Context is a set of entities rela related to that actor. In those entities, we count uh, taxonomy nodes, in this case, attack techniques used. Then we have uh, the histograms. We're going to calculate uh, term frequency. Um, I'm going to show later uh, the details about that. And we're going to see uh, what are the interesting techniques in those actors. This, this is done automatically, so almost no human interaction here. So this is how the uh, threat actor context looks like. We started with the same actor, uh, we walk the graph, we stopped at indicators because there are no other entities there, or we stopped on generic uh, mitre technique entities. This is our context. That's what we're gonna look like per one actor. And uh, in this talk I'm gonna show the data gathered for uh, two data sets, uh, it's like China and Russia, uh, data sets containing actors uh, and uh, we generate a context for those actors in those data sets. So for every context, we have histogram of uh, MITRE technique used. This is, looks like this hit, this uh, heat map with just counters, mm -hmm. which is uh, pretty and interesting, but um, gives us uh, raw information. So we need to th think to kind of figure out what's important here, because some techniques uh, marked here are used by everybody, so they're not uh, specific to this actor. So this, uh, this information has some noise in it. So what we can do to figure out what's interesting? We can calculate term frequency. This comes from um, uh, natural language processing, from machine learning, so this is used mostly for figuring out what's important in the blocks of text. But we can use, f with our we can use that with our taxonomies. It's quite interesting because it allows us to figure out uh, which are the most popular techniques uh, for a specific actor that are rare across the whole data set. So essentially, um, if you have like uh, a group 
conducting some activities, and they prefer specific techniques, and nobody else in this space does the same or does those techniques rarely, those techniques will be will have high value for this uh, for this group. So you're kind of figuring out the most popular exotic techniques, which kind of shows those peculiarities. Uh, we can calculate that per per context, and we'll get the vector like that. So for every uh, technique, we'll get some number, which is uh, term frequency inverse document frequency. Um, in this way, we can calculate like top ten or top twenty. Um, techniques per context, uh, per actor. And then remember we have a data set per nation state. So uh, before I go into that disclaimer, the data is super noisy uh, because humans uh, were typing uh, MITRE attack IDs in there, providers mislabel entities, uh, data model is not perfect, um, database is not perfect, so there are errors. And obviously um, our database uh, is not does not have full coverage of everything. It's just what we see. So don't take it with a grain of salt. And of course, there are a ton of biases in the, in the method and in the data. Right, so we have three flavors of TF IDFs. Uh, because naive approach is uh, quite biased, so uh, to just remove those biases, I, I calculated the frequencies in three different ways. Uh, so for example, for China, we have this three sets of top 10 uh, techniques used. If we combine these in one and remove all the duplicates, this will give us um, a set of kind of unique set of IDs that uh, somewhat define the data set that we have. So data set of actors for China and data set of actors for Russia. It does not, this does not have all techniques, obviously. This is just like uh, top 20. But these are top 20 that, uh, and they're not sorted in priority here, they're sorted by ID. But these are top 20 that uh, algorithm things are most important or the most defining for th the actors in these data sets. So you can see that as a, some kind of a DNA. Obviously, there are some techniques that are used by uh, everybody, like superficial link. So then those are there because everybody uses them. But most of these are somewhat unique to, to these threat actors in these uh, nation states. Um, so how can that be used? Um, it's kind of interesting because the, I think that one of the previous talks mentioned the over-tagging fatigue. So having this, we can hint analysts. Like, if you're looking at the activity for this actor, maybe like these five techniques are unique for that actor, so maybe pay attention to that. Or we can calculate similarity. Using the uh, term frequency of actors, we can calculate similarity between different actors, and we can say, hey, these actors look very similar. Maybe it's analysis, or maybe there's overlap, or maybe there's a relationship missing in our database. Um, Hopefully, sub-techniques, when they finally land in, in our database, uh, will help us improve uh, granularity. Because obviously, some techniques are quite generic, so it's difficult to uh, estimate um, their importance. But with granularity, this method might be uh, a bit more interesting, might provide better results. And uh, uh, the last thing that I wanted to do but I didn't have time to do yet is to generate these sets for uh, well-known actors that are described in MITRE uh, attack groups uh, and compare those and see how much we overlap uh, or we don't overlap and see maybe if what kind of gaps we have in the method and in, in, the, uh, uh, in our database. Um, that's it. Thank I think you. I'm rushed, I rushed to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, another question? Yeah. Uh, just a general question for you and the room. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we have seen an increasing trend of threat actor groups uh, emulating each other for misdirection. Um, uh, Threat actors can read the same things that we can online. Uh, I was just wondering if anybody had noticed anything spiking or had any thoughts on <laughs> at what point 
this body of information starts to uh, work against us as human beings are really good at turning everything into dual use. Yeah, that's an interesting one, right? Sometimes it's <laughs> difficult to change that though, right? Because I think those peculiarities in modes of operation, there might be there, the theories, uh, because of the skill sets. So like if you cannot find people to do specific techniques, then you cannot find people. Um, or just uh, established way of doing things. So just one one real nit, but you know you're talking about like you know when someone's uh, working on a report and it could provide you know a drop down or suggestions about techniques. I, I was thinking about the other way that if someone because because that could lead to that would sort of reinforce certain biases. Mm -hmm. But if someone goes to if an analyst goes to tag uh, a, a part of a report with uh, a behavior that's really out, you know, an outlier with respect to that group. I would think that's so like, are you really sure? You know, and if so, that's really significant because that's a, that's a change or a new detection of a TTP this adversary, at least within this data set, hadn't been seen using. Um, so I think that, I think that mode would be really, uh, would be really useful without probably introducing, without sort of leading people down a path. It's just sort of saying, you know, when they say, oh yeah, they did something that they've never been seen to do before, just make sure that that's really the case. Yeah, this for is, sure. This is fascinating work. Yeah, for sure. I think, and uh, it was interesting because pre while preparing this data, there was uh, one uh, drastic outlier, like the technique that just jumped with a high value to the top. And uh, looking into why that is, it uh, turned out to be that it was mislabeled, like the entity was mislabeled with the ID. Uh, like it was never seen in the database, uh, in, in our knowledge base before. It was used here, so it jumped as an outlier up. But it was um, useless because it was a uh, mistyped ID. And so one other thing, and I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your presentation, so you might have covered this already. So that you know, there, you know, there has been some work done by us and others on the use of true, you know, actual DNA sequencing uh, uh, algorithms, uh, usually applied to. Um, Features extract or properties, code properties extracted out of malware. And I was just curious if there was some intersection or overlap here where, you know, you look at malware and, and more sandboxes are, are extracting out what they perceive to be adversary behavior and, and using that to feed into this to sort of relate groups with malware, even if on the face of it they're not related. Yeah, yeah, on the malware analysis, yeah. I think this algorithm is mostly using the data that we get from providers, so it's only uh, it's only as good as the data that we get. But um, um, your parallel with the feature extraction for DNA is interesting, because for this context that I generate, like MITRE attack is just one angle, right? Because we have various uh, taxonomies, like industries, uh, uh, technologies used, tools used, victims, uh, etc. So we can have all those angles, and we can calculate these vectors essentially for all those different topics or different angles of threat uh, threat actors' activity, and we can use those to calculate better distances. Uh, so it's not just MITRE attack, but other uh, taxonomies as well, which hopefully provide better coverage. Okay, thank you. Uh, it, it's not really a question, it's more a fear. Uh, I, I'm really excited with all those uh, upcoming sub-techniques. Uh, now, uh, as an analyst myself and malware analyst myself and, and tagger and trying to get sense out of the data, the challenge I face already with myself and, and some other people have mentioned it too, um, is to ensure that uh, when we mark data with, with the right tags and taxonomies uh, and, and right techniques, 
and and we we do it in a consistent and repeatable way and to do so we need to to know or be aware which elements exist and right now we already have so many techniques and and as you mentioned richard um one way they are not specific enough on the other they are uh, rather specific and we're frustrated when they are not specific enough and we're frustrated because we can't remember all of them in our head immediately now um, this will bring an additional challenge when we go to the sub techniques also we need to go there that's for sure it's, it's really extremely valuable but when doing so I'm, I'm thinking about two things one um, the tools we use will need to really help us um, because um, it will be, we will have so many choices we have, and uh, that the tools. Well, as as other people mentioned, uh, is it from sandboxing or, or or even software like allowing us to add tags? So, for example, like MISP or or, or even or, or eclectic or or yet yet other all the the dollar software that exists out there. So, I think one one thing is the software really needs to help us to to guide us and help us try not to make mistakes and get mm. find trees and the right trees in the forest and. Mm. Not forget those that are of value. That's one point. And the other question, maybe towards Meyer, is um, when working on those migrations and communication, um, uh, it's a very tough question, but um, uh, don't ask me how, but it would be great if you could maybe do some blog posts with some use cases and recommendations where you would uh, give some examples to people. Like in the past, you were doing it this way, and, and with the new system, with the sub techniques, we would recommend you to do it this way, although there are different roads that lead to Rome. But it might be uh, a great if, if Meyer could spend some extra energy to help us mm -hmm. uh, be guided by your, your exper expertise. Uh, on, on that level. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah no, it, it absolutely does. So let me take them in reverse order. On the second one, yeah, we're going to try to create as many, we, you know, we, I think we understand the potential disruption and impact and, and burden on the community. Again, I think it's a good trade ultimately, but we don't underestimate the impact it's going to have on the community. So um, we're going to try to have as many different resources. I, I think the idea of some tutorials and, and just any kind of material that helps people understand, you used to do this, now we do that. I was talking to someone earlier, I can't remember who, I apologize, I think it was Thomas from Sigma, uh, about mm -hmm. uh, uh, having uh, just, you know, like, you know, a YAML file that would show the mapping so you could easily ingest. So, it, you know, just one place. So we say, you know, this technique, you know, is now found, is being renumbered to this technique. This technique has now been moved under this tech as a sub technique here. You know, just, you know, that kind of stuff, but uh, also some real practical, practical guidance. So I'll, I'll take that back. Mm -hmm. um, with, the, with respect to the first thing, so we've, we've done a couple of things in, at the CTI summit, the San CTI uh, summit in London earlier this year, and uh, Trey was the chair of great conference, one of the best ones I attended oh, all year. Oh, we're doing it again this year, uh, oh. next year. Sorry. Oh, and when is that, Trey? Uh, that is uh, in, in March. I'll, uh, I'm unprepared. Go okay, ahead. it's in March. Uh, but <clears throat> we did a, uh, a, a a CTI tutorial: how to map threat intelligence to attack. Uh, we're going to try to package that up in some way and, and hopefully make that available to the community. Uh, the other thing is we have some work going on that I, I hope to have out early next year. Uh, and we're going to be talking more about this with the community because I know there's a bunch of people who've been working on different threads of this to do uh, create an open source uh, tool that will ingest natural language descriptions of activity and propose candidate uh, mappings to attack techniques. This is something that a lot of, I, I think I'm aware of six different efforts that have gone on around different communities. So what we're going to try to do is, um, I mean, people can continue to pursue it if they want independently. We're going to try to do one sort of production quality resource, uh, and, and, and then try to get people to help, you know, create training sets so that we can get better and better. So I think to your point, have it so it would be, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, um, you know, a, a resource you could just call via an API and say, here's a block of text. Tell me what, you know, the candidate techniques. Um, that's why I was really interested in what Sergey just was talking about, because that to me feeds in there some, there's a, there's a linkage in there somewhere potentially. Um, 
uh, as well. So that that's another resource we're trying to uh, create. We're also trying to create uh, some more sort of infrastructure, you know, based on the success of the attack navigator, it really, you know, my, <clears throat> my metric for success, when I, when we sat in a conference room one day and I said, I know, we need to build this. And my metric for success was literally the number of times I saw it navigator screenshots and ex image exports in conference presentations. And so every time I see one, it's like, <laughs> yay. Um, but there, you know, the idea was if we did, if we invested a certain amount of time and effort, more than any of you would have been able to justify most likely into some really reusable foundational resource, that that would be a, a win for the community. We're going to do the same thing with a federated attack repository to you know do a good job on a on a on to allow you to create a local instance of attack that you can extend and then sync with upstream or downstream providers um, I think the same thing is true here on you know natural language processing of threat mm -hmm. intelligence um, we're also talking about is there a, a good open source tool we can create that actually is integrated in with this natural language processing to make it easier for people to create threat intelligence that includes context and then gen automatically generate structured threat intelligence, i.e. like sticks to, and also a PDF of the output, you know, to satisfy both use cases, do it in a way and hopefully help drive a more consistent, um, you know, approach towards representing threat intelligence and try to make it easier for the community to actually produce structured threat intelligence with behavioral context in a machine readable form. Um, and, and, uh, and also start to do some things. I, I'm particularly interested in what we can do to start doing quantitative or qualitative assessments of threat feeds. Not to say a threat feed is good or bad, but to say, this threat feed, you know, you give it a data set and it churns on it and it says this threat feed has certain properties. And there was a talk, uh, in London that was basically, it was very similar to this idea. So we want to try to riff off that and work with that. Um, so we can start to say, oh, this is, this is a this kind, this data set you just gave us is this kind of a feed. And it's a very different thing than this, which is a collection of malware hashes mm. and to help people understand that. We just uh, get some more questions. Or no, feedback. I want to talk. <laughs> yeah, just go ahead. Yeah. So just a quick question. One of the things that we've seen from some companies pop up is uh, they're including remediations and detection rules together with the attack pattern. Are you thinking at one point to also having like a centralized repository of those that you maintain? So for example, OS query queries that you attach to attack patterns and so on, or is it completely out of scope? Um, you know, I think one of the things over time, like with CAR, you know, our intention is, you know, you can point your instance of attack, you can link your instance of attack with whatever repository or repositories of detections or mitigations. So we're not in the business of trying to maintain the one ring to rule them all, but we're enabling the community to do sort of what makes sense. I guess my other point is if you uh, if you see other opportunities for where we can help drive community investment in sort of foundational resources that are available to everyone that stop short of being full blown you know products because that's not what we do that's not what the you know we're, we're we at least are not out there to try to create some you know the world's greatest open source threat intelligence platform we're trying to take and create useful resources that are available to everyone that make it easier to use attack um, and then let the community build on and the vendor community build on top of that but so if there's anything there's, just let me know there is one thing that I mean there are two things that I wanted to remind you about things that you've promised in the last few workshops <laughs> And one is not about things that you build, but things that have been built by other people, and to have like a landing page of resources or links to other resources, links to tools, links to things. And, and I think this is still, this is still for me high on the agenda because people, often I speak with people, have you seen this? Have you seen this article? Have you seen this tool? And then I look at me and what are you talking about? Yeah, there is this GitHub something, blah, blah. And I think it would be good if you would have a page of useful resources in your, in your, in your repository or in your, in your wiki. 
Yeah, no, it's a it's a great it's a great suggestion, and it's I, I don't know why it's so difficult. Uh, I think people are very concerned about anything that looks like it would be an endorsement of any particular thing. We've We've encountered this and overcome this before, so I'm yeah. I, I'm I'm going to make a Maybe concerted effort to do that. Maybe you can just create one link, and then we will create a page, a landing page for all these. You know, and the other thing is, people have asked. The other thing, if you have, if you don't remind me of this, uh, I I will. Uh, is some sort of Stack Overflow kind of persistent question and answer forum for you know you have a newbie coming into the community and in a, they have a question that it's new to them, but mm. you know it's one that's been asked and answered a hundred times. Can we have a, a mechanism whereby, you know, we we can we can mm. have that kind of those kind of threaded conversations around particular topics? So the, the second promise that you made already at the first meeting was that we would have a more transparent process of updating and vetting of new content, and, 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 and I, I still think that it's not done yet, and so it's. Yeah, I, we we absolutely know that we need to move to a more transparent way of of uh, you know just having a ticketing system. If nothing else, I can open an issue on a particular technique, uh, and you know all of a sudden I you know I say I think this technique is uh, needs to be refactored, and then one of our team can say, oh yeah, we're working on that. Or when we go to do it, we open an issue, say this technique needs to be refactored. Mm. So before anyone in the community goes and spends a lot of time. Yeah, you but check it should that. be a little bit more open or public than sending an email to the attack. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm saying a public uh, issue uh, tracker. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah, just a quick follow-up to the previous one. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned that you're kind of hoping for the community to build these things, and that's great. I mean, we've seen that effort pop up everywhere. Is uh, One of the trickiest things I see with um, with these mappings between attack and something actionable is uh, that there can be misunderstandings of the various different patterns. Would it be an option for you, for example, to take these bigger efforts out there and just check if the understanding of the translations to, for example, OS query and other types of uh, query mechanisms is really what you expected when you described the attack pattern? It, that That's a hard one because that it basically says that we have sort of a potentially unlimited, uh, unbounded, you know, I mean, we see someone dumps a billion rules into something and all of a sudden, like, you know, uh, so it would be nice if someone could vet them or we figure out some way to automate some of that vetting. Uh, but that's not something I, I would, you know, just uh, sign up for easily. How can MITRE help us with uh, um, pushing our vendors into the right direction? And, and, mm. and uh, so when we ask them to, uh, can you provide us uh, a mapping to the MITRE tech framework, for example, an EDR solution? Um, they will kind of be offended sometimes in, oh, we, can't, we cannot do it all. And uh, But how can MITRE help us with that? So, how many people here are familiar with attack evaluations? All right, so that's that's a pretty good group. I mean, so one of the things which are so attack evaluations is something we started last year, and it's a it's a program where a vendor ED in this we're currently focused on EDR. We're going to look to expand it over time. Vendors of EDR solutions come to us voluntarily. Uh, we did round one last year. We had about 13 vendors who came to us. They pay us a small amount of money. And for that privilege, uh, our red team in round one took and used our APT3 av adversary emulation playbook, and we attacked their product operated by their people as the blue team. So the vendors, the blue team, operated in a, in a cloud space that we set up. And we published the results of that. Good, the bad, the ugly. The vendors don't get to control whether or not we publish, so a vendor can't do poorly on the evaluation and then change their mind. Once they do it, they're committed. Um, and we don't declare winners or losers, but we just publish this data set uh, that's very exhaustive, that sort of categorizes the detections. 
We're doing round two right now. Uh, our red team is going to be is APT29, so a very different adversary group. And we have, I think, 20 or 21 vendors signed up. So uh, the one thing, and I, I don't, you know, as Freddie said, no commercials. You know, we're a nonprofit, but this is a service that the vendor does pay for it. So I just want to be clear about that. One thing is to say, hey, are you going through attack evaluations if they're an EDR product? And if the answer is no, then I think the question is, well, why not? You know, it's twenty something other companies that think this is this is helpful because it is a way to the extent that the, the these first two rounds of evaluation and the round two results will be out by February, I believe. Uh, you know, they they do give you an objective set of uh, results about how individual products did, operated under kind of best case circumstances, how those products fared against. Uh, behavior as expressed in the attack matrix. So, you know, it's not, it's not everything, but that's a start. The other thing I would say is if the vendor says, well, I don't know how to use attack or it's too complicated or whatever, you can always point people at me and say, well, you know, Rich is a reasonable guy and, you know, call them up and, and see what resources. We, as you all know, we have a lot of publicly available resources, uh, you know, that ever, that everyone can use and, you know, we'll try to help vendors. I mean, these evals are not designed to punish vendors. They're designed to help elevate everyone's game. So if a vendor goes through the eval and they see, we didn't do really well at detecting this behavior that our competitors actually all did much better than us, hopefully that inspires them to improve. But there is another aspect to it, I believe, is that you have to generate bus yourself as well. And what has happened repeatedly in the last year, and that it, it started with the first workshop we organized here in, in Luxembourg, and we had invited a number of vendors. And in fact, after having, me having talking to them, like, you should support MITRE attack. And then they said, well, nobody else is talking about it. And they came to the workshop, and then they had that, all these people talking about it, and they went back. And the next workshop, six months later, then they came to present results in their products. And the same is true for Sigma now. I mean, I, I, in March this year, I asked a number of vendors, are you supporting Sigma? And the answer literally was, Freddie, you're the only person in the world that has asked this question. And okay, two months later, I mean, you are talking about it, BSI is talking about it, and, and it creates a buzz that creates the pressure on the vendors to come up with, uh, with solutions. So I think it has to come from both, from both sides. The other thing I'd say on, with respect, you know, we we're talking about nat natural language processing, you know, of threat intelligence to extract attack techniques. Uh, I mean, just I'll make an, what I think is an obvious statement. It would be far better if the mapping of threat intelligence to attack techniques was happening as far upstream as possible. Mm -hmm. So when someone at uh, a national C-cert or a P-cert or at a threat intelligence provider, you know, before they, you know, hit save on the PDF, you know, where is the mapping to specific attack techniques and over time sub techniques? Where's the structured data set that allows me to quickly generate a navigator image, a visualization of what this report is talking about? What's the analytics? Yep. Plus the, the automatic links to the detection rules that are publicly available. We need to start setting expectations with our uh, threat intelligence providers. That's one of the reasons that, you know, I'm interested in this sort of how we characterize threat intelligence. So you could start maybe running a tool. Of, hey, you know, I, I just ran a, a, this tool on the last year of data we've gotten from you. And there's, you know, almost no context. And, you know, you need to do better than that because there are other vendors that are. So I think there's, there's so many different things we can work on, but, you know, trying to improve the, the upstream content providers job, you know, help them do a better job and encourage them to do a better job at doing that mapping proactively will save us from having to go and infer behavior. Because if you're writing the report, theoretically, you know, you should have the best knowledge of anyone as to what you actually saw, what was actually going on. Next. Okay, if not, then I think we have to thank again Cycle for hosting us. And
And then, yeah, we hope to see all of them again next year in May. No? Yeah. I have two things. I, I want to, or three things. I want to thank Freddie for being the spiritual leader of this cult. <laughs> Um, I want to remind everyone that AttackCon will be streamed live. Uh, if you can't watch it live, all that content will be up on YouTube, but I really do encourage it. Uh, it'll, it'll have an interesting different flavor than this, but in some ways it'll be similar in terms of mostly what you, you're going to hear a little more from MITRE this year because people said they wanted to hear more from us about where we're going, what we're doing. So you'll hear more from, you know, Blake and Katie and Adam and others. Um, but at the same time, you're also going to hear, you know, what different uh, organizations are doing to implement attack. Um, and the last thing is I want to thank all of you. This is a community. Uh, you know, attack is so much bigger than just MITRE. You know, we are honored to sort of be the, the focal point for this. But if, if it weren't for communities like, and people like yourselves, you know, this really wouldn't matter. So thank you for making this possible. Keep up the contributions. Keep up the hard questions. Keep reminding us of promises <laughs> we've made and haven't yet delivered on yet, Freddie. <laughs> um, but seriously, we're, we're happy. This is, this is why we do it. That's why I flew here, uh, for this. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's go and let's change the game on the bad guys. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs>